Okay, hi everybody. I've really enjoyed all the talks. Um, uh, I want to present some work that's been a, a, a very large team effort and uh, uh, two of my co-authors I think have joined here uh, uh, partway through our seminar. Uh, Ken Frank from Michigan State and Chin Wen Lin from the University of Chicago are both on, so I will wave, wave, hello, wave hello to them and introduce them. Um, uh, what, what we've been working on uh, is, uh, you know, like we, we've, we've heard already, like from some of the talks, is, is there's really this huge demand for expertise. And part of that demand that we haven't talked about yet is, is sort of demand for the scientific evidence of like things that may help ameliorate the symptoms or cure it or prevent its spread for, uh, with pharmaceuticals. Um, we've been talking about sort of more of the policy sort of, sort of responses. Um, and I think, you know, sort of given the urgency of the epidemic and the range of the stakeholders that are involved, it's really important that, that folks have a shared interpretation of how robust these scientific findings are as they come out. And it's probably more important than ever. And, um, and so this is a talk about proposing one way uh, in which, uh, which you, you, might, you might do that. Um, and so look, why, why is it kind of a hard thing? Um, uh, it, it, it's particularly hard right now because unlike sort of what we, what we know uh, uh, about the non-pharmacological -pharma, uh, interventions, we really don't know what's gonna work right now. Uh, and there's a bunch of research being done that's utilizing a bunch of different designs and uh, a lot of times really, really small studies. And so interpreting the robustness of these small studies is not, is not, that, uh, is not that straightforward as I'll sort of show in a second. So that's, that's one big challenge. Uh, the other big challenge is that, um, you know, Jesse sort of showed uh, how all these dashboards are sort of collecting all the information. And I've been using as my backdrop uh, the COVID-19 dashboard. These, these trials are happening fast and happening at a fast pace. And it's not enough just to get them out there. We have to sort of synthesize the results and make sense of them in almost real time. And so these are kind of the two big, these are kind of the two big challenges. And so what, what, um, what our general approach to thinking about robustness of inferences in, in studies of any kind is it's something actually this whole team, Ken and Chin Wen and, 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 and uh, a number of others who are the co-authors on, on this paper have been working on for a while is we are trying to take uh, uh, acknowledge that inferences I muted we're good okay uh, can you still hear me yeah okay uh, so that that inferences you know from studies of all types they're they're almost always imperfect and they have some uncertainty and so our approach is that we want to quantify that imperfection uh, and then ask the question, how big would it have to be to change your inference? What would it take to change your inference? And so uh, uh, Ken Frank has been working on this for a very long time uh, in, in various contexts. Uh, Ken and I together have uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, develop an approach um, uh, applied to continuous variables uh, of, of the continuous outcomes. Chinwin, who's a co-author, has tried to extend this to sort of mediation models. Together, we've developed all sorts of tools uh, to put out there. So Rain Shu is sort of taking the lead to develop a module called Confound in Stata uh, that you can use to do this sort of analysis. Uh, we have this website, confoundit.com, which was used to do the analysis I'm going to show you right now, and some R packages as well that do this. So this has been kind of a big effort, and it hasn't been about COVID-19, obviously, and it hasn't necessarily been about medical trials. Uh, but as this has been coming out, uh, uh, we've engaged uh, several others who have a little bit more experience in this, epidemiologists and medical doctors who are also co-authors in this work, um, uh, uh, to, to apply it to this emerging data because we think it can be very useful. So let me just sort of just jump in. I think the best way to do it is jump in and just sort of give, give an example. So this first example is, what, yeah, I think, the treatment we all heard about very early on, which is the hydroxychloroquine, or HCQ for short. Um, and uh, it, was the, it was what was touted by Trump as the miracle cure very, very, uh, ver very early on. Um, and uh, some early evidence came out that, was not, uh, that didn't have control group. Uh, but the first study that came out that had a control group was in Renmin Hospital in Wuhan. Uh, and they published a not yet peer reviewed study that I'm sort of going to use as an example. So it wasn't a double blinded study. Uh, but they did have, it was randomized and they did have a control arm. 
uh, the control arm got the standard sort of got conventional standard treatment. And um, their inference, the inference from that study was that adding on the HCQ was efficacious. It helped. There was some benefit. And the basis for that inference is, is, is taken from this two by two table you see here. They kind of looked at, well, they looked at a few outcomes. One of the outcomes they looked at was um, sort of reduction in pneumonia, uh, how much, uh, whether someone's a pneumonia improved or not. And they said that, you know, 55%, 17 out of the 31 control patients improved uh, and compared it to 25 out of 31 treatment patients. So it was 81% to 51%. And when you sort of look to see if that was statistically significant, it was. Okay, and that was sort of the basis of the, the, basis of the inference. It's efficacious. Um, so what, what we want to do is we want to say, okay, how robust is that finding? It comes from a small study. We know it was statistically significant, but can we say more about its robustness? And so we've defined this quantity. We call it the robustness of inference of the switches, which is just conceptually and, and actually technically the number of treatment cases that would need to be switched. So the number of cases that got the treatment, they would need to be switched from a successful outcome to an unsuccessful outcome uh, to cross a threshold of a given effect size. Okay, so to make the, to make the effect size a certain, a, certain, uh, a certain level, to make it say small enough to where it didn't matter anymore. And how do you define didn't matter anymore? Or how do you define a change in your inference? You can think of it as a, some kind of substantively important level. And we've noticed in some of these clinical trials, sometimes they define something called the minimal level of clinical importance. You know, this would be a size, this would be an effect size that would be interesting. <laughs> They'd be worth it. In policy terms, you can think about where the benefits might outweigh the costs. This would be kind of like our, our breaking point. Uh, but the most common thing that gets used is statistical significance from zero, okay? And so that's what we're gonna use in the examples now. So think about how many cases would I have to switch from the, in the treatment group, within the treatment group, from being successful to unsuccessful in order to lose my statistical significance. Um, and so uh, that's, that, that's how it would look like on this two by two graph. So how many of these six cases that uh, had, uh, um, uh, actually I drew it the wrong way, I think. Sorry, flip it, I'm sorry, flip, 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 the, uh, flip the arrow, but the idea is how many of those um, 25 cases would I have to switch to be uh, uh, unsuccessful, okay? Just flip, flip the version of the arrow. So how many of the 25 would have to move over to the six cell? And to put this kind of in context, we have this little graph where the y-axis is the effect size, is the treatment effect, and the black square is the 26% difference that they observed that was statistically significant. And on the x-axis, we have the number of cases you'd have to switch from success to failure in the treatment group. And each of the white dots is kind of a different point on that, and it shows what happens to the treatment group. The top dashed uh, line is statistical significance at the 5% level for a positive effect, and the bottom dashed line is statistical significance uh, for a negative effect at the 5% level. And so when we ask the question, how many cases would have to be switched? Turns out you just have to hop over one dot, okay? So one case would have to be switched. RIS would have to be one in order to invalidate the inference. And so I think this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's a statistically significant result, but this tells you a little bit more, I think, about the robustness, that if only one case got switched, that we would draw a different inference. And two, I don't actually need to know a ton about probability and statistics to understand that notion, that if one person were different, I would draw a different substantive inference. So, um, uh, so we think it has this ability to be more generally understood, uh, and it also has this ability to give you a little bit more information, um, to give you a little bit more information about, uh, uh, about cases, especially cases that have small sample size. Uh, where it's kind of uh, 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 the robustness is sort of harder to get a handle on. Give you another quick example, just came out this Wednesday. So you heard Tony Fauci talking a lot about remdesivir and an unpublished study on remdesivir that showed some, some, some effects uh, on uh, reducing the, uh, the length of the uh, symptoms, the duration of the symptoms. Uh, on Wednesday in the Lancet, a clinical trial got um, uh, published that was a different clinical trial. That was double blind, double blind placebo controlled trial, I think also in Wuhan, um, that did not reach its full, they wanted to get like 450 patients or so, I think they got like 236 because they just didn't have any more available patients, which I suppose is good, which I suppose it is good. Um, um, 
so they had to kind of cut it off and report the results. But it was randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, sort of like the NIH one that's being talked about now in the, in the background. This study found no discernible difference in, in, uh, in a number of measures, including mortality. Okay, they didn't find a statistically significant difference. It was inconclusive. They, they found that 22 of the 158 uh, patients who had the treatment uh, died within 28 days, uh, while 10 out of 78 in the placebo group died. So 14 to 13%. And so here's the same two by two table. And so if we jump over and do the same sort of analysis, we, um, uh, the black square is the estimate. It's not statistically significant and it's kind of close to zero. We can ask ourselves how many cases would we have to switch to, change, to, to, to make it statistically significant one way or the other. And so if you go 14 towards the top line to the blue dot, uh, towards the top, if you go 14 in that direction, it will become positive and statistically significant. And if you go 16 down, it will become negative and statistically significant. Okay, so um, uh, that's how we've quantified the robustness of the second, of the second uh, study. Now, what's really interesting about this is that there's going to be more and more research that gets done uh, as we go forward, and we know there's one coming, coming down the pipeline. Uh, so a real challenge is going to be how do we take this information and kind of combine it quickly with the information coming up and not just sort of try to get an estimate of its effect size, but try to kind of, kind of like combine these things in terms of robustness. Okay, how do we think about the joint robustness? Because this, is, this was a pretty well done trial as well. Um, and, and it's not just this one case. I mean, if you look at this dashboard that I was using as my backdrop and the kind of stuff that Jesse was talking about, there's 686 trials going on right now on all sorts of things. And you can search and sort of get various categorizations. Uh, and then this is just, this is being updated by the, almost by the minute. And so that we're gonna have this constant need to keep this, 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 uh, this uh, both effect size and robustness kind of counter going. <laughs> um, and so we're gonna, obviously we don't have that yet, it's still emerging. So we're gonna use a historical example uh, that we took from a meta-analysis on hypertension, um, where they try to look and see what the effect of taking drugs to reduce your, uh, your hypertension had on a number of outcomes, uh, in, uh, and in particular, uh, the probability that you're gonna get st stroke, okay? So in the very first of these 16 trials that were in this meta-analysis published in 1990, it was a similar to the remdesivir example. There was a no discernible treatment effect in the first study. Uh, and uh, you would need to switch cases from unsuccessful to successful in order to get an effect. So it's kind of the same scenario we have with this first, this first case. So then what we did is we created, sort of started creating a graph where we can sort of accumulate this evidence. So there's the first study. It's going to take six cases to get me up to the blue dot. The blue dot is the, is the effect size of the treatment effect just past statistical significance. Okay, that would get me to statistical significance if I got up there. And it's sitting down very low now uh, at, the, at this black dot. A year later, maybe less than a year later, another study came out that actually was statistically significant and showed a positive effect. So if you combine those two together, you get kind of this average effect uh, that is somewhere in the 5% difference range, okay? And we can update the robustness of that joint effect. And so together, it would take four switches to get me away. That study by itself would take five switches. If I just looked at that study, it would just take five switches. So we combined the two things together. We got an updated treatment effect, so to speak. But the robustness really hasn't gotten better yet, because if you look on the x-axis, this is the year of the study. Uh, this is the first update, and we went from having 87 pay cases to 467 pay cases. And then what we've done is we've tracked out the, we've tracked out the rest of the cases, 567, 70, 73, all the, the remaining 16 sort of uh, uh, effects and their corresponding, their cor and then the uh, parentheses have the cumulative sample size of the whole group. And so if we kind of keep going, you sort of get this trajectory where you see that early on you have this effect size is kind of bouncing around um, and you have this relatively unrobust sort of answer um, uh, for a while, but with every single dot that I reveal, I can kind of give decision makers new information, both about the overall treatment effect and very importantly, uh, how, robust, how, robust it might, how robust it might be.
And so we think that uh, we think that something like this could be done with the kind of dashboards that I, we have behind us to help uh, give a real time sort of interpretation of the robustness and of the overall of the overall effect. So in summary, we think expressing uncertainty in terms of the patient experiences can really help the make the robustness of a particular inference clear, even if you don't have this deep knowledge of probability and statistics. Really, really important, I think, when the studies are small. Like if you notice over here, where the studies start getting, when we start getting a really large end, the confidence intervals aren't that big, right? So it's not so hard to figure out if it's, if it's robust. It's when it's small or it's a bigger problem. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and then we also think that it can do, you know, can do this in a, in a way that can facilitate a common understanding that we really need to have a bunch of a variety of sta uh, stakeholders right now. As a society, we try to decide uh, when to take action on something that could have certainly benef benefits, but also potential side effects.